Hello everybody, I am Napog and I'll be showing you how to make your very first origin. In this episode, we're going to be covering how to make tick and load functions, what entity actions are, what entity conditions are, and what are the benefits of using tick and load functions over an action over time. Now that we're back into our IntelliJ idea, download in the description by the way, we have our tutorial pack opened up and you'll be met with the tick and load functions. So in each of these, there are two tick and load functions. There's one that is a load.jameson and then there's a load.mc function. The difference between these two is very significant. The JSON files are basically what initialize that you have the functions. So in the Minecraft tags functions folder, you will have tick and load and that you can name them whatever you want, but typically it is best to leave them as tick and load. Now that you're in it, you can see that here it is called tutorial colon load. You can change the name from tutorial to anything you want, but you have to remember that this folder over here, refactor, rename, and you can rename it to whatever you want. For now, we're going to keep it as tutorial. The same thing applies to the tick.json file. Now that we're back into the functions folder, I'll briefly get into what the load and tick function do. The load function basically runs commands when you first load up the data pack. So this can be whenever you do slash reload, whenever you first put it into your server or single player world, or when you run the function itself. The tick MC function is quite different from the load. Instead of doing it when it's first loaded, it does it every tick, which is 20 times a second. Basically, a regular command block without having to be placed anywhere in the world. One example of the tick function being displayed is if we grab the command slash say hi and we go over to the tick.mc function folder and we paste it right in here. Now, the, the one thing you do want to remember is that you want to get rid of any slashes. Slashes are not read in MC functions. You can just type them like this. So now we can just save all, go back into Minecraft and we can do slash reload. Now, if I turn off F1, you'll see the server says hi. And as you can see, that is what the tick folder does. Now, if we go back into the editor, remove slash say hi, and put it into load instead, remove the slash, file save all, and then come back into Minecraft. If I slash reload, after the reload, you're gonna see it only happened once. So if I clear my chat, there are no more highs. It only occurred once. So what are the benefits of this, you might ask? Well, some benefits include the fact that you can run commands through the data pack without having to put a command block in the world. This can be for just checking general things. If you are dealing with any kind of entity conditions in the game, you're checking for a certain mob, certain item that exists in the game, or checking for a player, or trying to send a message when you first install the pack, for example, if you want to say thank you for downloading this made by not Pog, you could put that in and it will only display once when you first install the pack. So those are the benefits for the load and tick functions. And some of you might be wondering, how is that any different from the action over time power in the Origins Wiki? So there are a few differences between the action over time and the tick function. As you can see here in the Wiki, the action over time is something that is looped. But the difference is the action over time is only ever looped when the player is online or whatever the entity that has the power is online on the single player world or the, or the server. So what that means is if someone has an origin and they have an action over time, if they log off, the action over time will no longer occur. And especially if they have something, for example, in my most recent video, the doorman origin, the doors they still work offline because rather than putting the commands in the action over time, I put them in the tick function. That way, if I'm logged off, but I want to leave behind some doors for other people to access, 
it will still work because the action over time will basically become useless the second I log off. But the tick function will continue running as long as the server is online. Now moving on to entity actions, if I go over here. Entity actions has a lot of options, um, but I'm going to briefly explain what an entity action is. An entity action is essentially what the name suggests, an action for the entity that has the power. So for example, if I want to add velocity onto my character, I can go into the add velocity and add the entity action into the field of whatever power I'm using. So for example, if I press a button and it calls for an entity action, when I press the button, then it will add velocity. Or another thing you could do is apply effect and you could follow one of these multiple effect. I mean, one effect or multiple effects over here or a bunch of the other options. And you can de definitely take the time to read each one of them. I think the most useful ones are definitely execute command, add velocity and apply effect because you mainly use those for origins. For example, when you're underwater, you get water breathing. When you press a button, you get a dash or just general things with commands because Minecraft commands are very expansive. Moving on to entity conditions. It is essentially very similar to entity actions, except now instead of actions, it's conditions. So entity conditions are for conditions for the player or creature that has the power. So for example, if I want to detect that I am underwater, I can go into the entity condition on the wiki and I can find submerged in. So if I click here, submerged in, and then it gives you a fluid. And then that can be either water or lava. So as it says here, it will check whether the entity's eyes are in the fluid. So once your head is submerged, it will it'll basically return true for your power. So if, for example, like I mentioned before, you have an action over time that gives you, let's say, a poison effect every time you're underwater. One of the things to make it is you would put in the entity action that applies the effect, but you don't want it to happen all the time. So then you add an additional entity condition and then add the condition submerged in. So that way it only gives you the poison effect when the condition returns true. And yeah, that basically covers entity conditions. And there are a lot of options here and you can definitely take the time to read through all of them. For example, exposed to sun is self-explanatory, but there are some also very complex, not, not very complicated ones, but definitely a little more niche ones like block and radius. Like the name suggests, it detects for a block in a certain radius. But overall, they're very s simple to follow. And as you can see here, they have their own little fields like invisible. It doesn't even have a field, but Raycast will have a bunch of other fields like by entity conditions, which I will get into right now. Moving on to by entity stuff, I will briefly cover by entity actions and by entity conditions because they're not too expensive, but they're definitely something to consider. So basically, by entity conditions and by entity actions are for anything that has to do with other mobs. So what that means is the entity that has the power, it's checking for other mobs around the player. It really depends on the entity action or power that you're using. For example, if I go into entity actions and I go into area of effect, you'll see here that it has an option for by entity actions. So that means everything within the radius, it will execute a by entity action on those targets because it is applying effects not to you, but everything in the area of effect. And there are some other ones like Raycast that call on by entity actions, but most of, the, most of them don't. But there are some that do, especially if you want to do something with other entities, like if you look at a creeper, you give them slowness. You could use a Raycast for that. But anyways... There are some options in the by entity actions like add velocity, damage, mount, set and love, and tame. These are very limited, uh, but there are some differences with the add velocity compared to the entity action. For example, add velocity for by entities 
are relative to your position rather than their position. Whereas if you give them an add velocity to, for them as an entity action, now it'll start tracking from their position rather than yours. And if you want to do that, you can do that with target action. So if you click on target action, it will bring up this window and you can basically give it an entity action. So normally you cannot give by entity actions, entity actions. But if you want to give them the ability to, for example, run a command to say hello, then you can do that if you use target action. And the same thing applies to by entity conditions. These conditions are for anything that is not you, but in a certain AOE or anything that calls on by entity stuff. So for example, if I want to check if I'm looking at a creeper, I can definitely put target condition and then use one of the entity conditions, which is over here, where it says entity type. That is one way you could do that. But there's some options that by entity conditions does without having to do target condition, such as if the entity is writing, writing root, writing recursive, which is basically different versions of writing when it's mounted. Relative rotation, which is basically rotation based on it, your rotation. Owner, so basically it's checking if it's a pet. Distance, so checking the distance from you. Can see, self-explanatory. Attacker and attack target are both self-explanatory as well. But yeah, that's basically it for by entity conditions and actions. So yeah. That was a brief overview of what each of those do. I didn't do very much programming in this tutorial, but I did go into a brief summary of how each of the little mechanisms, mechanisms work. And so uh, I hope you leave this video with a little bit more understanding. And if you have any suggestions, criticism, or just anything you would like to see covered in future videos, please let me know in the comments. But if without further ado, I am not Pog, and I will see you next time. Peace.